webinar that is sponsored by Verado. Uh, the title is Accurate Patient Matching and the Future of HIEs. I'd like to welcome Mr. Mark Leroux, Chief Executive Officer of Verado, and he will be joining us now to be the facilitator for this particular session. In addition, if you have questions throughout this particular presentation, please feel free to use the chat box and we will take those questions as after the end of the uh, conversation. In addition, if you could mute, mute your line for recording purposes. Thank you very much and welcome Mr. Leroux. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, welcome everybody and thanks for uh, agreeing and setting aside some time in your calendar to spend the next 40 or so minutes with us. I appreciate it. I'm Mark Leroux. As Lucy mentioned, I'll be your host and moderator for the, for the webinar. And we have a pretty interesting subject area for you um, entitled Accurate Patient Ma Matching and the Future of HIEs. And um, we all know that HIEs are a technology-driven business, like we wouldn't exist without technology. And ultimately, our ability to match patient either enables or disables future business and future services that we want to provide. And so uh, it's a very interesting and important topic that ties both business and technology together, although this discussion will be predominantly about business and services. I've got two great speakers lined up for you, and I'll make uh, formal introductions of both David Horrocks of, of CRISP and Dan Chavez of SDHC in a few moments. But uh, let me just do a little bit of the housekeeping and introduce myself before I start the, the full seminar program. Here we go. So the agenda we have for you today is simple. Uh, we'll do some brief overviews. That's what we're in the middle of doing right now, myself, and then David from CRISP and Dan from SDHC. Uh, and then we're going to switch and talk about the patient matching imperative for HIEs. Uh, and to do that, I'll give a, a broader perspective, and then I'll ask uh, both David and Dan to talk about the current state of patient matching at both CRISP and SDHC. And then we'll get to the real meat of the presentation. Probably 50% of the time, maybe a little bit more, will be a discussion from Dan and from David about the new initiatives uh, that are underway in their HIEs, uh, you know, what they are, and then ultimately why they're driving need for better patient matching. Uh, and then we'll finish up with Q&A. So anything that you want to talk about, either what we, what we presented or... Uh, other thoughts that occur to you that you think the, the seminar participants might be interested along the same lines, it would be really appreciated. Uh, as I said, I'm Mark Leroux. There's a picture of me. I think I look pretty happy in this picture, and, and I am pretty happy, so it's an appropriate picture. I'm, I am the CEO of Verado, uh, and I've been here since uh, early 2015, came in with the major venture funding that got brought into the company, uh, previously at Ernst & Young and at MicroStrategy. Uh, more importantly, though, um, the company I, I, I work for, the company I'm the CEO of, is Verado. And Verado, if you don't know who we are, just two slides on that kind of quickly. Verado uh, is a software as a service company, and we offer a cloud-based MPI uh, and that we've called the Universal MPI. So Universal MPI is how we branded it, or, or UMPI, we sometimes refer to it. And uh, this UMPI, this new cloud-based MPI, is based on a uniquely powerful technique for patient matching called referential matching, as opposed to the probabilistic matching that exists in virtually all other MPIs in the market today. And this universal MPI does the usual thing that you would expect of an MPI. It, it, it links patients' information from disparate sources, and it does so with the highest accuracy rates benchmarked in the industry today. So that's what you would expect of a, a brand new uh, technology in this space to do, and we do that. But what our technology also does, which might be a little bit less uh, expected, maybe somewhat more surprising, is that our universal MPI can also be used to dramatically improve, or as it says here, turbocharge the performance of existing older MPI technologies. And so many of our customers start off using us for this simpler turbocharge use case and then transition over to having us become their in, uh, full linking system. Uh, now, um, one more slide on Verado. So the thing to know about Verado is that we've been in this business for a number of years. We've got the venture funding up for 22 million at this point in time, but more importantly, we've had a single and very intense focus, both from an investment and personnel standpoint, in perfecting this one new matching technology, this referential matching. 
which is now instantiated in our universal MPI product. Uh, and at this point in time, we've now acquired a good number of customers, many of which are in healthcare, and many of our healthcare customers are indeed HIEs, because HIEs fundamentally have the most important and most difficult patient matching problems across all of healthcare. Now, what I'd like to do now is uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, and uh, David, I'll turn the podium over to you in just a second after I do the introduction. I'll have you give a quick overview of Chris, but, but David is the president and CEO of CRISP. He's been with CRISP uh, since the very beginning at its inception in 2006 and when the business formally started in 2009. And uh, David has held a, a good number of positions, executive positions and operational positions of, at both large and small companies throughout his career. And uh, David comes with a pretty impressive educational background with an undergrad in engineering at UPenn, an MBA from Wharton, and an MPH from Hopkins. So um, a little bit overeducated by my taste, but you know, the guy has a lot of time. I'm on still his going hands. too, Mark. I can't stop. Yeah. What what are you do what what are you trying to get now? I, I don't know. I'm still at Hopkins. Oh, okay. The well, RPA. Well, with that, David, um let me turn the podium over to you. You can introduce yourself any further that as necessary and then give a an overview of Chris. But I'll turn the slides for you. Just give me an indication. Thanks, Mark. I think there are a couple slides on uh Chris. We are a regional HIE. We started in Maryland and uh, expanded to uh, serve the District of Columbia uh, maybe uh, four, four or five years ago. And then in the last uh, two years, we've partnered with uh, the Wynn in West Virginia to uh, provide some infrastructure for their HIE. There are about 100 hospitals in the region and uh, 6 million people in, in Maryland, 2 million or so in West Virginia, and a bit less than a million in, uh, in the district. We provide, uh, if you go to the uh, uh, next slide here, Mark. Yeah, we, there are really five core things that we do. The first, like most HIEs, we deliver information uh, to the point of care. And uh, we began doing this with a web-based portal. Someone would log into, enter demographic information, and, and view documents. Uh, but there are now uh, big variations on this theme, which uh, I think we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, we deliver notifications, especially uh, about hospital encounters. Uh, and there are uh, variations on, on that theme as well. Third core product is reporting and analytics. And this relies very heavily on the MPI. Uh, we combine data sources, claims data from different hospitals, matched with ADT data, uh, and some, uh, especially in Maryland, some all-payer claims data type sources uh, to provide quality measures and uh, financial measures and, uh, and some other things, both for uh, provider organizations and uh, for the state. We support public health use cases with things like uh, the PDMP, and uh, and then we do a bit of uh, administering programs which rely on uh, connectivity, some care redesign programs. So that's, uh, uh, that's us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. So now, and I'd, uh, Dan, I'd also like to introduce you. Um, let me give a quick background and then let you talk about STHC, but uh, as it says here, Dan joined STHC as the executive director in March of 2013, and that culminates uh, a, a long career uh, in healthcare, dedicated to healthcare, as a matter of fact, where Dan's applied his skills at some very large companies as well as a range of smaller startups. So Dan's seen the entire spectrum of the healthcare um, ecosystem on both the technology side and even on the uh, provider side, I believe. Dan's education is a BA from San Jose, uh, San Jose State and an MBA from Stanford. Dan, you want to go ahead? Yep. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Next slide, please. As Mark uh, articulated in, in the preamble, uh, San Diego and San Diego Health Connect is a very diverse community, uh, which uh, really sort of amplifies the patient matching challenge 
our geographic catchment area goes from the Arizona border to the Pacific Ocean with um, the entire bottom 70 miles of California. And, and as such, it's again, very diverse. It's, it's beach, it's mountain, it's desert. We have 140 miles of international border. In fact, we uh, sit on the busiest land border crossing on the planet. We have three military facilities, the largest veterans population in the country, uh, 18 sovereign Indian nations, several hospitals, about 115 clinics, and 9,000 physicians. So a very, very diverse community uh, and a lot to manage as it relates to patient matching. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, similar to CRISP, uh, we are a regional community health information exchange. We are a not-for-profit public benefit organization. Our service offerings are very, very similar to CRISP's uh, standard kind of HIE offerings uh, that we try to make available to our entire community. Uh, 4.8 million patients have been properly identified. Uh, you may note from the previous slide that's on a population of 3.5. We get a lot of visitors to San Diego, both tourists, military, as well as students. Um, we do have, uh, by design, a little bit of a consent challenge. Uh, we have only got about 2.8 of those uh, million, 2.8 million patients of those consented, consented to share information. We have 90% of our hospitals participating, 95% of our federally qualified health centers participating. We're doing about 20 million messages a month, uh, and we're in the active uh, process of migrating from uh, a federated model uh, to a repository model. So uh, anxious to share more as the conversation progresses. Thanks, Mark. Okay, Dan, thank you. Look, uh, let me give a, um, we're gonna get back to Dan and David in just a second. I'm gonna prevent, I'm gonna, and they're gonna talk about the business initiatives, oh, I'm sorry, the, the matching initiatives and the business initiatives within each of their HIEs. But to set a, a broader context, I thought I would um, take a step back and look at the entire country for a second and just give you an, a view of, of why patient matching is a national imperative and indeed why it's entering into a national level of conversations. Um, three different topics here, legislation. For those of you who aren't aware of it, um, a law was passed in December of 2016 that's been colloquially called the 21st Century Cures Act. Uh, this is like uh, 312 pages of legislation. It's a pretty amazing piece of work. That's the first legislation that I've actually waded through myself from front to back. I didn't read every word, but um, I did read a lot of it. It's just pretty astounding. It represents about $6.3 billion of allocated funds over the coming years, primarily for NIH and, and the Food and Drug Administration with respect to drug uh, approval, but it also has some instructions to the ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator. Um, but again, this 21st Century Cures Act is predominantly about opioid epidemic fighting and, and accelerated drug approvals and, and research for precision medicine and cancer moonshot and all the kinds of things that you think are center stage and right in the center of the conversation of national health care. But interestingly enough, uh, you know, around page 150 of this tome, what you'll find is a very interesting section that talks specifically about healthcare IT which to me is an astounding thing that healthcare IT is making it into, into legislation. It's even being talked about in Congress, but at, at, there is some specific language in this law, in this act about EHR interoperability in section 4003. But here's the thing that gets me is in section 4007, there's specific instructions in this legislation to the General Accountability Office, the GAO, to conduct a extensive study, two-year study, on specifically patient matching. Patient matching has now been written into legislation of the land and the goal of this is to get some movement happening. It's clear that uh, even at the level of Congress, they've concluded that not enough is being done to solve the patient matching problem. A follow-up letter was written by five senators across party lines, so three Democrats, two Republicans, uh, Senator Warren of Massachusetts, Senator Hatch of Utah being the two primary authors, I think, of this letter and, and, and representing cross-party line interest in this. But this letter, and this would astound all of you, and you can Google it and find it, there's a letter written by five senators stressing the importance of patient matching to the national health strategy, to, to our entire health care strategy 
patient matching. And they're instructing GAO to redouble its efforts through this investigative period and come up with some recommendations for standards or other means by which the nation can establish a national patient matching strategy that's truly effective. So it's a tall order, but this, this topic is now top of mind, <laughs> even at the, at the highest halls of Congress. Uh, we also know that there have been a number of patient matching competitions. In fact, one of them, I believe CHIME, is due to announce the results of their uh, patient matching challenge, a $1 million prize today. Uh, and then also the ONC, listed here as healthit.gov, I think that's their logo, but the Office of National Coordinator uh, is also, has also conducted a patient algorithm challenge. And these two challenges have been put forward largely because, again, third-party organizations like CHIME and ONC are recognizing that we're not solving yet the patient matching problem. And this is an attempt to, you know, to turbocharge or to energize the, the industry to find a solution. And then there's um, independent research. Uh, no, I, I highlighted this one in the slide here. Notably, the Pew Charitable Trust launched an initiative last year, a, a research program, as they call it, on healthcare IT. And it has several important um, goals, and I've listed them here, to, to determine the practicality of a universal identifier or a universal identity system of some sort. And I think that's largely to review the results of the CHIME um, challenge to see how realistic it is at a national scale, but also to study the standards for demographic data, the role of patients in managing their own matching. And this fourth one here is particularly near and dear to my heart is the, is the role and use of referential matching and third-party data to in greatly increase patient matching effectiveness. So all of this is being spun up right now and into the near future, and we all need to be paying attention to it because it affects our industries, our jobs, and our effectiveness. And obviously, the reason everybody's interested in patient matching is because so much, uh, so many of the patient records we have in our EHRs today and patients being presented at hospitals today are unmatchable for lots of technical, some societal reasons. But the problem is particularly poignant on the right-hand side. You see that um, based upon the CHIME study, that up to 50% of patient records are not accurately matched when the matching occurs between healthcare systems. And this is precisely the HIE challenge. If we thought patient matching was hard within the four walls of a, of a hospital system, it is more two and a half times harder to do it across hospital systems. And that's why, uh, that's why Dan has the gray hair that he does and uh, David's going back to school to learn something to help. But it's an important problem. $17 million in the annual cost for denied claims due to patient misidentification. And 86% of these survey respondents in this Ponemon survey um, said that they saw a specific medical error resulting from poor patient matching. And now, obviously, uh, patient matching is the foundation for HIEs, but it's the foundation for an awful lot of the services needed in order to make uh, healthcare efficient and effective in the, in the U.S. And it's not just the services that we see today, but it's new services that are being conceptualized by people like Dan and David. So with that, I'd like to turn the podium over again, just briefly have uh, perhaps David first and then Dan. David, perhaps just give an idea of the current state of patient matching at CRISP. And then, and then I'll introduce Dan to do the same. Sure, Mark. So I, I'll first, uh, if I rewind to when we began providing services, I remember we had a big debate whether to get an industrial strength uh, MPI for matching or just to use the largely probabilistic tools that were in our, our portal. And we decided to invest in the stronger matching capability. It was one of the best decisions that we ever made. Um, as you know, as you've already said, the matching is really the core of what an HIE does, receives data from many places and uh, has to determine uh, what belongs to the same person. <clears throat> so uh, that was a good decision and we uh, chugged along for a while, but we are finding that uh, the more data that we receive, the longer we are in operation, uh, the more our challenges grow with uh, duplicates and, uh, and false negatives. We have to tune our MPI to make a false positive, of course, a very rare event. 
uh, as I'm sure other HIEs do. Uh, but but the more success we have in, in getting feeds, the more we have uh, a challenge with those duplicates. And I think compounding that <clears throat> is that we are no longer just putting uh, information in a portal where a human being can look at, let's say, two records, one of which is kind of close, but but not 100% uh, sure, we, we can't just put those in front of a clinician because we are pushing data right into the workflow of an EHR. And it's, in an essence, the machine has to make that decision as to whether uh, the competence is high enough. So we can't rely on, uh, on clinician judgment uh, in these new use cases. And, and uh, and it's pushing us to, uh, we need to, we have to go back to our data sources and uh, those who are sending us inadequate uh, demographics, we're having to uh, uh, work with them or even turn them off. We've our work with our all pair claims data sources has been uh, particularly difficult as we get some, some garbage data at times. Uh, there's another thing that we're struggling with a bit and that is that as we move to this automated delivery of information, the number of times we're hitting our MPI is growing um, exponentially. Uh, we already deliver more information. We call it an auto query. There are more times that, that, uh, that we push information in front of a clinician right in the EHR than there are times that a clinician comes and, uh, and asks. That happens about 7,000 times a day, but about 10,000 times a day, we actually push the information. And for every time we push information, there's another 10 times that, uh, that we're checking on a patient. And, and so the, the burden on our MPI uh, is uh, at least tenfold what it was um, just two years ago. So we've, we've also implemented referential matching and it's been a big help in uh, eliminating these duplicates and giving us more confidence as we, we put information in front of uh, clinicians. And of course, Mark, we've done that with you guys. Yeah, we appreciate that. Thank you. So a, high, so a much higher volume and a much higher demand on making the match correctly so that you can push it directly into the workflow of a clinician. That's yeah, it's very demanding. Uh, Dan, um, the story at SDHC? Absolutely. So um, our, our experience has been uh, a tremendous evolution of lessons learned as we stood up the HIE and augmenting traditional master patient index technology with referential matching. Uh, in San Diego, we're extremely conservative. As we stood up the HIE, our community demanded a uh, hundred percent automatic match rate from the health information exchange uh, traditional MPI technology did not support this and consequently we needed an automatic hundred percent match on six variables lo and behold we were only getting about 70 percent on a good day of those six variables so very quickly our exception queue grew this became a tremendous barrier to implementation of the HIE. And that's when we came across, after some investigation, referential matching. And we started to augment our HIE stack MPI with referential matching and quickly managed that exception queue uh, to less than 5%. Now, our community, being our community, uh, didn't believe that we could do this in an automated manner. And they put us through several tests uh, with referential matching uh, to see that it did work. And initially, we did this as batch files back and forth between San Diego Health Connect and Verado. Um, and, and after about 12 months of arduous testing uh, with the community, uh, where Verado did participate in these uh, test work groups, uh, we proved that we could do this in an automated manner. And we quickly evolved from batch files back and forth between the HIE and the referential matching engine and real-time 
resolution of our mismatches. Uh, we've been doing that for about six months now, and we're in the process of moving the entire master patient index to the referential matching engine. Uh, we've got that kind of confidence in the technology, in the algorithms, uh, in the service delivery, that we're now doing that as a community. The community's thrilled to do that. Um, again, this, this has been over a 24-month process. Uh, there's value to going down this process together uh, with uh, a firm like Verado, uh, as they've built tremendous credibility uh, with the community. And now the community's got enough trust and faith with regards to how the process works that they go back and they make the changes to the source enterprise MPIs in our participant community. Uh, and then Verado has been working with us uh, very diligently as we've established a standard naming convention in our community. And now we're in a position to take master patient index to beyond query response and some of our traditional HIE services, and we'll talk about those momentarily, and, and really take master patient index and patient identity and patient records matching to the next level, whether it be in the real-time emergency scenario in the ambulance, um, in dealing with pulsed physician orders for life-sustaining treatment, and eventually, where we really want to go with the social determinants of health. But we'll, we'll, we'll take those in a moment or so. But the accuracy has got to be there to get the, to those advanced workflows and those advanced applications. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Yeah, so, you know, Dan, both yours and David's um, descriptions described an environment of HIE success, but that success breeds the challenge of having higher accuracy, higher interactivity with this patient matching, uh, and higher volumes, all three of the things you have to solve at once in order to proceed forward. Well, let me um, let me again just draw, uh, put up one slide or two slides to kind of um, paint the bigger picture. But, you know, HIEs, if, if you all don't realize it, those of you on the phone and Dan and David have already just described it, but HIEs face the most difficult patient matching problems that there are. If you're looking for, if, you're, if, if anybody, the government or anybody is looking for one organization where you need to prove out a patient matching technique or strategy or technology, it's the HIEs, because HIEs have the hardest patient populations to deal with. And I know that's a kind of a big, broad, overarching statement, but look, HIEs deal with multiple hospitals, usually in close proximity to one another, so that there's a, a very large overlap of people between different hospital systems. So you're going to find a lot of positives, true positives, between hospital systems, and you're appropriately supposed to find those, whereas hospital systems for themselves can optimize for false negatives. They can allow duplicates because they don't have nearly the overlap that you'll find in an HIE. Um, nor will they see the same amount of stickiness. You know, people move around a geographic area. They might move from one hospital system to base, you know, to across town, use another hospital system predominantly, but it's still being serviced out of the same HIE. So you have that, the HIEs have that longitudinal view of patients that go way beyond what an individual hospital will have to deal with. Compound that patient uh, diversity with the fact that HIEs don't have the luxury of, of uh, tight standards committees that can be enforced all the way down to the source systems and tight governance community or um, uh, organizations to enforce policies and different rules, as it says up here, different rules for correctness. I mean, HIEs don't have the same leverage over their membership that a hospital system has over the different departments within the hospital. And that plays a huge role in the effectiveness of matching technology, you know, and we, we all know this. And the other thing to note about HIEs that makes it much harder than hospital systems is that there is much more change within an HIE than you will ever find in a, in a, in a provider system. You know, many more uh, patients are being onboarded and maybe just as importantly, everybody who onboards, every new member of an HIE becomes one more critic, one more test point for that HIE to prove its value and to prove its, pa uh, its path forward. So it has to be better than anything you would find within the four walls of a hospital system. So when you go home at night and you wonder why your job is so hard, just re remember these points because they're all very true. 
Now, this, the main purpose of this presentation is not really to talk about techniques and technologies of, of patient matching, but rather talk about the new initiatives. The, futures of the, the future of HIEs is business expansion, and one of the dimensions of that expansion is indeed new services to be offered to your communities. And so I've asked Dan and David to think about some of the specific initiatives underway at their HIEs and spend you know, three or four or five minutes just describing to everybody on the phone what those different initiatives are. And, and here are the six that we picked on the screen in front of you. And maybe what I'll do is I'll ask David first just to talk about the prescription drug monitoring program at CRISP. David? Sorry. Thanks, Mark. And our, our PDMP uh, efforts are uh, uh, primarily in the state of Maryland. And uh, the state of Maryland has uh, turned to us or contracted with us to operate uh, the PDMP. We receive um, dispense information from, I think it's like 2,700 pharmacies uh, uh, every day. That information runs through our MPI and uh, we put the information in a repository. There are about 20,000 uh, prescriptions uh, for a script scheduled drug across the state every day. And uh, the state has mandated that every prescriber uh, must be registered to use the PDMP. And by next July, we expect the state will mandate that uh, every prescriber must check the PDMP prior to, uh, prior to prescribing. So uh, there'll be a big volume and uh, in addition to that, the, the way that most many prescribers, especially at the hospital uh, systems, are going to handle this is they are automating the check. And so every time you open up a patient chart uh, at the hospital, you'll receive, uh, it'll run a check against the PDMP, whether you're intending to prescribe something or not, and you'll see if there's been any dispense medication in the last 60 days or 30 days, however they configure it. So the volumes are going to be very big for us. Uh, so that's that's our uh, the crux of our PDMP, Mark. Yeah, it's a big program, it sounds like. I'm sorry, I missed your... Did you say this is live right now or it's coming live? Well, the PDMP has been live for uh, two and a half years. What's coming live in July is the mandate that uh, you must check. So perhaps we have... 5,000 times a day, someone will look for PDMP information. Uh, we'd expect that that will grow to 20,000 come uh, come July. I see. Wow. Okay. Got it. Um, Dan, uh, do you want to talk about patient-centered data home and the initiatives at San Diego? Yes, happy to do that. The patient-centered data home is a national interoperability play by several health information exchanges around the country. Uh, this is organized and centered around SHEIC, which is a strategic health information ex exchange collaborative, which is our HIE trade association. So the membership within SHEIC, the HIEs, are putting the scalable method of exchanging patient data between HIEs across the country. And, and this is really based upon triggering episode alerts which notify providers when a care event has occurred outside of their patient geography. In other words, another health information exchange. And so we're able to confirm the availability of information uh, of a patient when they're having care out of state, out of region. One, confirm we have that, we know that patient. Two, we have that patient's information. Three, send it to where that patient is receiving care. And consequently, there are several hubs across the United States. San Diego Health Connect is part of the Western States hub. Uh, today, I am actively sharing information with Arizona, Utah, Colorado. So if I'm skiing uh, in, in Colorado, hopefully in the very near future, and I unfortunately have uh, an accident there, um, we'll figure out that I'm Located in San Diego is my home. Uh, that's based on patient zip code. We'll query San Diego Health Connect, verify that, in fact, we know Dan Chavez, um, and then have the ability to send 
my longitudinal health record to Colorado. So this is expanding very quickly among the 55 members of Sheik, uh, effectively tying all the HIEs together across the country, all very centric uh, to doing patient identity and patient records matching correctly. Yeah, across across regions and across HIEs. Thank you, Dan. Um, David, back uh, back to you. Uh, the delivery of information for for care management. Yeah, Mark. And there's two sides to this. Uh, one, as I had said earlier, our first major use case was delivering documents at the point of care. Well, increasingly, as uh, provider organizations take uh, a broader responsibility for patients' care and they're part of uh, um, uh, value-based care programs, we are uh, taking those documents as the receiver, routing them to care managers uh, who will ingest them into their care management applications. We're pushing our alerts to care managers and uh, a new set of customers. I think perhaps even more interestingly, we are extracting, I call it patient context information uh, from, from the documents we receive uh, to put in front of that ED doc. And it context information such as, this is the name of this person's PCP, and this is her phone number. And he has a care manager and in this program, this is the name of his care manager, and here is his uh, contact information. These are the resources which are offered by this care management program. And the, the idea being, uh, if that clinician can coordinate um, with the care management program and say, ah, I see I can, get, I can get my patient in to see his PCP in the morning, and I see that uh, there are transportation services to make sure that he can get there. I can safely discharge him and avoid the admission, which is expensive and probably not great for the patient. So uh, we've been pushing hard to, uh, to bring those things live over the last 18 months. And uh, at about uh, um, a third of our hospitals, that information is now, is now popping uh, automatically. Again, the theme of integrating um, the HIE into the into a process, in this case, the care management process across constituencies. Yeah, very interesting. And Dan, um, San Diego is doing a lot now to integrate the HIE with uh, emergency medical services. Yes. You want to talk about uh, that? I've got, yeah, happy I've got to do a that. Uh, or two. Yeah, I think you do. So as a result of an ONC in the state of California grant, uh, we were chartered with driving greater integration between our EMS and ambulance community and our hospital EDs. Uh, the title of that grant was to develop an application called SAFER, which stands for Search, Alert, File, and Reconcile. And this was to be a very fast, very high integrity workflow between ambulances and EDs with the health information exchange in the middle. So it starts with the proper identification of a patient in the ambulance. Uh, and that's done between the ambulance EPCR, electronic patient care record, and the HIE. We, we quickly do a search of the master patient index of the HIE in the, from the ambulance. Once we've verified that patient's identification, uh, we send four pieces of information very quickly. Friendly reminder that in San Diego, the average ambulance ride is sort of in the 25 to 30 minute range. So we've got to respond very quickly so we can provide very accurate, very uh, high integrity information to the EMTs and paramedics in the ambulance. So we send a problem list, a medication list, an allergy list, an encounter list, as well as a pulse form to the ambulance real time as a rolling to the emergency department. In addition, now that we've properly identified the patient, we send an alert to the emergency department with the real time stream of the electronic patient care record from the ambulance that includes vitals, narrative, uh, EKG, 
uh, in images uh, if they're available from the ambulance to the emergency department concurrent with the patient's full longitudinal health record from the HIE. And then we follow up post encounter uh, with the ambulance record integrated into the electronic medical record from the into the ED. And consequently, we can follow up back with the disposition from the emergency department as well as the hospital into the ambulance record. But the key point here is it all starts with the quick identification of the patient in the ambulance. So once again, utilizing this phenomenal uh, technology that we've worked hard to develop and perfect uh, to get the right information about the right patient at the right time. Yeah, and again, the theme of integrating yourself into a real-time workflow with critical information. This is um, it's getting to be a theme throughout the, this presentation. Um, um, two more topics, um, David, um, interconnecting and supporting public health as part of the HIE's core services. Well, Mark, we do probably seven or eight different things with uh, our public health departments, um, especially in Maryland. Uh, and uh, one of the newer things that we are doing with uh, the Maryland Department of Health, we've integrated with a few of the disease registries. And uh, what we are doing is uh, with uh, some of the hospital emergency departments, if a patient uh, arrives who has a drug-resistant infection um, or has tested positive for Zika in a certain uh, time period, that information is, uh, is showing up as an alert in the ED. And uh, these are situations that would require uh, a different approach to treatment, of course, and uh, um, are important for patient safety reasons. We have been live with this for, uh, I think, three or four months, and uh, I know that we have fired fewer than 100 alerts at this stage, but it's a high-value uh, piece of information, and as you said, it is another instance of integrating right into the workflow, and it requires us, uh, of course, matching on yet another data source, these uh, public health registries. Yeah, man, I think I, I, I met, you know, uh, I work for a product company. We're a product company, and I think about what it takes for us to bring product to market. And I look at this list of, we've gone through five, and I'm going to ask Dan to talk about social determinants of health in just a second. But it, again, it surprises me and kind of humbles me a little bit to think about all of the products that you guys are bringing to market and uh, the effort it takes to spin them up technically and um, from a customer acceptance standpoint, it must be challenging. Dan, do you want to uh, you want to round up this conversation here and talk about social determinants of health? Yeah, happy to do that. Uh, as I believe we all know on the, on this call, you know, the healthcare view of an individual is only by 20% of that individual. There's a lot more to capturing the full picture, that 360 degree view of a person, and that's health behaviors, physical environment, socioeconomic factors, et cetera. And so gathering that information just makes the patient identification, patient record matching challenge exponentially harder because now you've got to integrate the whole degree of other kinds of organizations that house their views of what this patient, what this person may look like. And, and that may be the counties, the social services agencies, the community-based organizations. And, and as such, we really want to get that information correct and, and give that accurate view of the patient. And, and so if we're going to move to population health, which is I think is our, our collective goal, we've got to do a much better job of properly sharing patient identities and patient records with our counties, with our social services agencies, with our community-based organizations. Now, there's a real challenge in making that happen in that HIE information, HIE master patient index information is PHI or protected health information versus personally identifiable information. And what we're exploring in our community um, with Verado 
is utilizing referential matching to make some of the sharing happen in a much more automated manner. And that way we can provide the right level of service to people um, as they need things like housing, transportation, food subsidies. But the first thing we need to do, again, in my opinion, and in the opinion of the Health Information Exchange and the community, is starting with properly identifying that person. And I think referential matching will be an excellent way to make this happen without any violation of sharing PHI and allowing this workflow to occur so that we, we can properly provide care to a lot of these folks. And so we're really looking forward to making these changes, uh, exploring this, uh, make, sharing that information with us, our social services agencies, with our community-based organizations, et cetera. So looking forward to making this happen. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Well, everybody, um, let me just, let me um, wrap. Thank you both, uh, both of our speakers, David Horrocks and Dan Chavez from CRISP and San Diego Health Connect, respectively. I mean, in a short period of time, you've covered a lot of the landscape of what's causing, not causing, what you're pushing forward into your market through your HIEs, um, just illustrating the dynamic nature of your businesses, everybody's businesses in the HIE space. Um, you know, we're living in an extremely interesting time, both for our careers, uh, for the industry as a whole, healthcare, and even for the society. So maybe and for society, because everything we do, everything you guys do affects everyone. It affects uh, the, the, our very being, our health, right? So um, HIEs are at the very forefront of this change that's underway. And, and in a lot of ways, the HIEs are the pioneers. You guys are being sent out to face the unknown, to invent, invent things that have never been done before, to blaze the path. Mm -hmm. And you're doing that from a business perspective. You're doing it from a technology perspective. And you're cognizant of standards and policies and legislation that is creating an environment around you. There's just a lot going on. And that's always a good and a bad thing. The good part is nothing's ever boring. It's, you know, we're living on the edge of discovery. And the hard thing is, is the exact same thing. We're living on the edge of discovery and having to invent new things. You know, uh, and although we didn't explicitly discuss it in this in this webinar, I think that we all know that uh, the existing technology that we're using uh, isn't going to get us all the way there. Uh, and in fact, if we talk to ourselves uh, secretly before we go to bed and we we admit to ourselves that the thing that's really worrying us probably the most is the fact that we we, we haven't yet charted a path to perfect patient matching, and there is no perfect mat path. But we need to find a path to get not just a 5% improvement, but a 75% improvement in order to make all of this much better and deliver more value. So the service expansions that have been discussed by David and Dan today ultimately depend upon that. Um, we want to help, but um, more importantly, we want just the overall industry to be successful in this transition. So with that, let me open the phones uh, or ask Lucy if there are any questions that have been submitted that that you want us to answer. Lucy, are you there? Thank you, Michael. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm just checking now if we have any questions. Uh, no, I don't have any questions um, at this time. Maybe okay. you could share one or two commonly asked questions uh, that you hear from the market, especially among HIEs. Well, you know, I, I won't speak for Verado because it's not a Verado commercial, um, but, you know, I will maybe put Dan and David quickly on the spot and just say if they wanted to say one thing about um, uh, not necessarily patient matching, but, you know, running the HIE and looking forward into the future, you know, what are the things that either excite you or, or um, challenge you the most? Uh, and, uh, David, I'll go with you first, and then Dan can think of his answer <laughs> while you're working on yours. And when you're done, I have one question that came in as well, so. Okay. Yeah, I, I, Mark, for us, I think it's that we have moved away from, from just pushing documents to extracting these, uh, what hopefully are high-value high bits of information and, uh, and pushing them. And and in doing that, the uh, 
the number of times that we have to do that in a given day is just growing and the reliability of the system needs to be higher and uh, I think we're going to look more like one of the administrative networks for uh, managing claims and billing where you know high transaction volumes it's got to be accurate and uh, uh, very reliable so that that's the transition we feel we're in the middle of yeah, yeah you almost describe yourself as becoming a utility that's used in many different uh, aspects of the businesses um, Dan, same question. You know, looking forward to the future, either a serious challenge or, or, or kind of what you see as the biggest opportunity or, or shape of the industry as it's evolving in front of you. Well, again, it's it's the balance to get more utilization of the health information exchange. That's across the entire continuum of care. Uh, again, very very excited to extend this to social services, community-based organizations. But by the same token, also these, these very high value applications, whether it be EMS or Pulse uh, or the like. Uh, so, so again, it's, it's, it's a great environment to be in. It's challenging. It's diverse. Um, again, you've got that balance between utility-grade information across the entire continuum and these very high impact, uh, high return kinds of applications, you know, in that, uh, in that EMS application, uh, in May, we took a heart attack patient in an ambulance and went from arrival to a stent in that person's chest in 16 minutes, when the oh. average around the country is 45 to 60. But that's, that's the power of accurate health information exchange, and it's just a, a great thing to be part of. Well, what a great and, what a great anecdote. And gentlemen, um, I actually have two questions, if I may. Yep. Yep, I see question, them. I, sure. Hey, Lucy, I question. see them. I'm sorry. You want me to just read them off? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, two tactical questions, guys. Um, and I'm not sure whether this was directed to Dan or, or to David, but the first tactical one: uh, what kind of volumes are you seeing for the exception queues? So, your manual queues. And are there staff dedicated solely to working those that that list of exceptions? Uh, Dan or David, do you have an idea of how many you know sure. potential matches so, uh, you generate? Yeah, today? yeah. D Dan here, uh, as part of our entire volume, that exception queues down less than uh, two percent. Uh, we manage that uh, exception queue with uh, a part-time half a person, if you will, I have an FTE consultant uh, in conjunction with the community. The community gets together, sits around the table and discuss this once a month. So, so for us, it's, it's half an FTE part-time uh, with the community. Uh, it's a 60 to 90 minute meeting uh, once a month. And Dan, is it true that San Diego uses the, some of the, the, the data stewards of its members as well to work some of this queue? Yeah, that, exactly. Uh, yeah, that that's that 60 to 90 minute meeting uh, that's coordinated monthly. Yeah, I absolutely. Okay. It, we, this is all all very highly leveraged with the community. David, any idea about your manual queue, uh, how it grows, and yeah. whether you've got staff? So our our manual queue is essentially defined as our, our, we have a matching algorithm that gives this a uh, unit list number, and uh, if you're below, let's say like nine you are not matched. If you're above 12, you are. Uh, we run the referential match, and it often, we call it hydrate the records. It might take an 11 up to a 13 uh, with the referential matching. Uh, that queue of people who are close is in the 2% range. We largely do not resolve those uh, identities. Instead, uh, they show up as duplicates. There are a few. There are a few um, exceptions. We uh, we do resolve cases for anyone who is in our opt-out list. Uh, we don't want to inadvertently create a new identity for someone who opted out and then start delivering data. So I would say it is about half an FTE worth of work to stay on top okay. of uh, those queues. 
Okay. Look, pick, this is the last question, and we'll all get off the webinar. But the last question kind of follows this opt-out point you just made, David. So maybe I'll point this one to you. And the question is: Is do either CRISP or SDHC have users submit requests to link or merge patient records? So, do your patients participate in the matching or unmatching, or in your case, opting out uh, of the matching environment? David. Yeah, they do not. Um, they they do not, and we've wondered how we could better crowdsource, but just have not made progress on this yet. I'd love to hear uh, yeah. from peers who, who have. Uh, Dan, and, and we're, uh, we're, we're right there with you, David. Uh, again, patients are not involved in this process uh, in any way in San Diego. Yeah. Well, the hard thing is, is, is authenticating the person themselves if they're going to do it online so that you're sure the person's only updating their records. Okay, um, let me let me call a close to this um, webinar two minutes before the formal end time. Thanks everybody for participating. Thank, especially thank you, uh, thanks to the the speakers, um, David Horrocks and Dan Chavez. Um, I, we really appreciate your participation. I think everybody learned a lot, and thank everybody else on the webinar for spending this hour with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. On behalf of Sheik, we'd like to thank Verado for uh, bringing this to us as a webinar, and also to Chris and San Diego Health Connect for participating. For those of you that are members, this particular uh, webinar with audio will be posted later today on the SharePoint site under webinars. Thank you all. Bye-bye.